Hello, hello, and welcome to Lawrence Plays for part three of this week's Factorio K2SD update video. We had a busy stream this week, and so there's been a lot to talk about, so let's get straight into it. I've talked quite a bit recently about how we're not really making the Naquium quickly enough at the moment, and having come over here to just sort of to show you this to make the point of it, I've noticed that it's actually not running at all, so that's even worse than I was expecting it to be. And from a little bit of investigation, I've discovered it's that we seem to have, um, we seem to have a shortage of sulfuric acid. No, we're, we're producing too much sulfuric acid. Yes, the sulfuric acid output pipe is full, this tank is filled up, and so everything has failed. Um, that's a weird problem to have. I'm going to have to investigate this one, because that's that's not a problem I would expect this system to have. I expect us to use up the sulfuric acid much, much faster than we're producing it. So, um, where does it, where does it go? Where does it come from? What, what is going on? So over here, we take some of it in. We've got enough of the red beads. We've filled up on those. And so somehow, yeah, we've just got too much of this stuff. So let's put that in there. We can put in another tank here, link it in with a cable across here. And then, well, then there'll be a little bit of headroom in here and things should start to work again. I do hope that we've not ended up in a position where we're producing the sulfuric acid faster than we're using it up. Although that said, if we do, maybe we could pass it off to be used in the beryllium processing. But that seems very, very unlikely. I think... For some reason, we seem to have just produced too much sulfuric acid, presumably from this step. And and that's weird, because I would expect this to produce no more than this step uses to produce the the, uh, the red beads in order to compensate for it. So I am very, very surprised that's happened, but I'll have a bit more of a look into it in the stream, I think. The actual reason I came over to look at this was to say, well, we haven't got enough Naquium processing over here in order to keep up with the system that we've got over, on the, over in Norbit that's trying to use it at an enormous rate. So I would like to build another one of these, perhaps next to it just over here and have that running so we can we can produce it twice as quickly or three times as quickly or four times as quickly significantly faster anyway the problem with that is that we've got this system set up out here in stardust which is taking in the the uh, the nequitite and then crushing it down to, to ship it on and at least if everything is working properly this system here runs at exactly the same speed it produces it at exactly the same speed as the uh, system over on Talos uses it at and so we can't increase the amount of processing that's going on without this system over here running out so we will need more mining which would mean if we're going to carry on with the system as it is would mean we'd need more crushers out here and we'd need more mines available around the asteroid field and we've tapped all of the good patches so that's going to be a bit tricky so essentially expanding this area out here on Stardust is going to be a little bit difficult uh, we're going to struggle to to get a significantly higher fl flow through here than we've got at the moment. And then, of course, we've then got all of these spaceships that fly back and forth carrying the um, the Naquitite, uh, bringing it back over to Kalidus to Talos, where it can then be um, processed down into the actual Naquium that we need. And so, yes, in theory, we could probably expand the, uh, the the facility on Stardust. We could go out, we could get set up more mines, we could have more trains running around, we could have more spaceships carrying it across, and so on. However, we recently researched Arcolink storage chests, and these things are able to teleport stuff from between one chest and another chest. So if I put one of these out in Stardust or somewhere like that, it would then immediately, anything you put into it in Stardust will be teleported to another chest which you could put perhaps on Talos. And so we could have belt after belt after belt of, of Naquitite flowing into this Arcolink storage chest and we could, we'd be able to do certainly eight belts going into it because it's a two by two and then that could all be pouring out over at the other end on Talos where we could crush it and then process it and so on. And then we get the extra bonuses for productivity for uh, crushing it with on, on a planet before feeding it into a fully productivity moduled system over there. And if we use deep space belts and deep space loaders to load it, and purple loaders, or is it green loaders, whichever one is the top tier, to unload it, then we'll be able to run those belts twice as fast. So instead of putting two belts of crushed in, we put in effectively 16 belts of uncrushed, which would make four belts of crushed, plus a bit more because of the productivity boost. So that would be at least tripling the amount of Naquim we're producing, if not more than that. So this would mean an enormous improvement. However, we'd have to go out to an asteroid field and get an enormous amount of Naquim coming in to, those, um, to the Arcolink chest in order to get it all transported over. So there's still going to be a lot of effort required for the mining. However, the transporting and the processing should go a lot more smoothly and a lot more easily. Now, I say eight belts going in. That's not quite true. It would actually have to be seven because we would still need to take iron and sulfur out to the other end in order to turn that into the acid that's required to do the mining. However, even with that, that's still going to be significantly better than it is at the moment. And as we've seen, pulverizers can take four modules. So that means we'll get a plus 56% um, boost on the productivity of these machines. And therefore, that's going to more than make up for having to have one belt go back out the other way. 
seven belts going in and then dividing that by four, but multiplying it by the 1.56 productivity from here, would get us 2.73 belts worth of crushed, effectively, which is slightly more than we have at the moment. However, if we upgrade that to deep space belts, then we get 5.46, almost five and a half belts worth coming out compared to the two we've got at the moment. So that is almost three times the amount coming out at the other end. So I think this would be a very, very worthwhile upgrade for us. And so this is the plan. So I've started putting things together a little bit to make the ArcoLink devices. And as you can see, this requires quite a lot of stuff. These are expensive things, but then given how powerful they are, you, you kind of expect that. That would make sense. So we need some of these dynamic emitters, and we've talked about these in the last couple of videos. Those are waiting for us to have an enormous number of quantum processors. Once we've got those, we'll be able to make the dynamic emitters and then chuck them in the box here, and hopefully things will work out quite nicely there. It requires uh, Naquium processors. Now, we've got a reasonable number of those being produced, so that is not a problem. It requires nanomaterial, but sure, we've got that on the bus over, on the belts over here. Uh, same with the, um, the lattice pressure vessels. Those are coming in on the same belt. And we also need the uh, heavy assemblies, again, on the belt. That's just iridium. It's fine. We've got plenty of that now. We're also going to need 20 antimatter canisters. Again, they're, they're, not ex they're not cheap, but we've got quite a lot of them being made. Finally, this is the one and only sink in the game for Arcospheres. So in every other case, every other Arcosphere recipe, I think, uh, citation needed, uh, when you take in the Arcospheres to make the thing, the Arcospheres are merely a catalyst. They may get altered into a different type of Arcosphere, but they'll be spat out at the other end as another form of Arcosphere, and you can then do folding and, and inverting to get them back to where you started from. However, making Arcolink storages do, does not do that. You do not get them back again. As you can see here from the recipe, they just get completely used up. So I want to make sure that we've got a decent number of Arcospheres before we, uh, before we actually go in and do this, and I want them to be the last thing we grab because they might as well be. Uh, so I'm, I'm at the moment, this is just waiting here happily. Mike has given me the green light for this to go ahead and make two Arcolink storage devices, so to steal 20 Arcospheres, um, although he has asked me to take them out relatively slowly rather than just going in and gathering an enormous handfuls of lambdas in, in order to let the system and the, the stirring and the inverting and the folding sort of get everything back to reasonably balanced um, rather than just throwing it into a massive tiz. So that seems fair enough. So I'll go over there, I'll grab one or two out, I'll grab and then let it, give it some time to settle, grab a few more and so on and, until I've got the 20 we, we're going to need because I'm going to need two of these chests, one to go at each end. The final ingredient, the self-sealing gel, is not something we had until now. So I've had to start making that, and that's not been too bad. It, it's a sort of it's a biological thing, really. So I've been starting being making it over here. And as you can see, this pulls in the, um, the the vitalic reagent, which is always a problem. We always seem to have a shortage of that. But at the moment, up here at least, it seems to be absolutely fine. We've also got the vitalic epoxy coming in. That's the light green bottles down here. Those are passed into the machine along with some cryonite. Now cryonite we didn't actually have over here, so I've had to chuck in an additional station here and then wire it up to request the cryonite trains we need. This is slightly more complicated than most stations. Normally you just put in a station, you say yes I would like some cryonite, and then you have a system to either set the train limit or to turn the station off when it's got enough. Uh, because the uh, cryonite is being taken both to stations up in an orbit and also down to the ground from, from the same place by the same train, we also have to send out a request signal because the train won't leave the pickup station unless there's a cryonite signal on here. So we've got two systems down here. This one monitors the amount in the in the in the box and says when there's less than two thousand, tell turn the station on, give it turn, set the train limit to one. And this one up here says when there's less than two thousand, send out a request for some cryonite. So that'll then go out on the network over here. It'll go over to the other station and a train will be dispatched and it'll come over here and drop the cryonite off. And as you can see by the fact that we've got a lot of cryonite here, that works perfectly. So we've got the cryonite brought in. Fine. That was fairly straightforward. These two uh, were on the on the bus over here because this is the bi biologicals area. So we've got plenty of these coming up. They were needed for the uh, for making all of the biter capsules over here. And so it was a relatively easy job to just extend the belts up a little bit, grab them off there. The methane gas, on the other hand, that was a bit of a problem. So I followed this one back and, and uh, discovered there's, there's a distinct shortage of methane being used on the entire bus, which is a bit disappointing. I thought there was quite a lot of it being used over here, but it turns out no. However, there was a system of boilers down here which are taking in methane ice and melting it and blowing the methane gas out on, into this pipe. And that was being taken up here to be used by these machines over here that are making, um, making uh, pink goo, or at least or so I thought. Unfortunately for me, it turns out that these machines were just just there to bootstrap things and to get things going when they were uh, in the early days. And since then, Mark has been using these machines down here, which use the coal and fertilizer recipe instead. Uh, presumably, he's decided that this one is cheaper because it uses coal and fertilizer, which are easy to make, rather than methane gas, which is slightly more complicated to make. So fair enough, he started producing it this way, and that meant these ones along here just basically they straight up weren't running, so they've been they've been turned off. And that meant that the supply of methane ice being brought up to these boilers had also been turned off. 
off, or rather, after we switched away from uh, delivery cannons, it had never been fixed and updated to run with trains. So I ran this pipe all the way down here, plugged it into these methane boilers and went, oh, we don't have any. So the next thing to do was to put in a train to bring it up, fine. And that meant putting in another methane ice train down here on the ground, being filled up from the from the bus. Uh, there's methane ice being passed out to well, this isn't clearly isn't the only place because I wouldn't have used it if it had been. I'd have gone from the other uh, for the other uh, for the secondary elevator. Uh, there seems to be some being brought over here for what are you for? You're for spaceship extras. Okay, so it's being taken off to one of the other planets. I think Talos needs it in small quantities. Or might do if there's not enough coming over from Stardust. Uh, it doesn't seem to at the moment. Note that whilst the belt running along here is completely empty, this one is completely full. So we've not taken any through since then. Since then. However, it does seem that we have a massive shortage of the methane ice over here. I guess it's being brought over from Big Red because that would be the only other input for this system. Um, but I don't know where it actually goes after that. So I think that's something I should probably look into. Because as I said, we've run out here. And that means that eventually we'll run out up here because we'll use it all and then it'll all get melted over here and eventually, eventually, in a very, very long time, we'll, we'll run out of self-sealing gel. Now at the moment, the only thing we're using the self-sealing gel for is making um, Arcolic storage devices. So there's not going to be a great deal of demand for it. In fact, there's more than enough in this chest already to keep us going for more than we'll ever make. However, I'm sure there's going to be other things that use it. So we can see here, if we ever want to make Prod Mods 8, we're going to need it for that. Behemoth capsules will need it for as well. Now, I can't see us wanting those. I can't see us really wanting the life support for either. It makes your uh, life support packs last a bit longer, so you don't have to worry about going back and replenishing them quite so often. But I don't think it's really going to be worth it, especially as it also costs an Aquarium Tesseract. Alcoholic storage I've mentioned. Med packs we just don't use. Planetary teleporters. Now, that's interesting. Uh, it doesn't, again, doesn't require a lot of them. We don't really seem to use planetary teleporters because, well, well, we haven't unlocked them yet, but I don't really think they'd be all that useful because we have the navigation satellite, and I think these are just for moving, yes, these are for moving players around on the same surface. If we could use those to teleport from one planet to another, that would be amazing, and we'd put one on every single planet, but they can't do that, so probably not worth it. The Mark IV thruster suits could be quite nice, but it only takes one self-sealing gel, and there's only four of us playing, so that's not a lot, again, not a lot of those required. And also you can destroy it, but we're not going to make it to destroy it. So as you can see, there's not a great deal of demand in here, with the possible exception of the Productivity Module 8, which does admittedly use 180 of them. We might make a few of those to go in the science labs. I suspect we probably won't use them anywhere else. I don't think we're even using Prod 7s for the Naquium processing, and that's probably the most expensive, and the, or the second most important place to have high-level productivity modules at the moment. So I don't think we'll use very many of those, but you never know. If we do, we're going to need to go out and find some more methane. So I've got a little bit distracted going through there, but um, that is essentially what I, was, what I was here to talk about. We've now nearly started making Arcolink storage devices. And as I was saying, once we start upgrading the Naquium production, I'll come over here, I'll hand feed in the, the right number of Arcospheres, because we certainly don't want to have them just sitting in a, in a box over here when they could be being used for something much more useful. So we're going to hand feed that with exactly the right number of the lambdas, and then it can make the chests, and then we can go out and set up the extra Naquium supplies, and we'll see how that goes. I feel like I look at Kothar pretty much every week and say, this week Mike has fixed Kothar so that everything is working perfectly and, uh, we got, and we're getting huge amounts of iridium through. And then every week he proves me wrong by going in and finding something else that's broken. This week, we discovered that Kothar had run out of mineral water, and after tracing the problem back a little bit, we discovered that one of the Kothar ships was missing this output pipe across the bottom here. So when the ship lands, it can be filled up with, with mineral water by with these three pumps that pump it across into the tank over here, then to empty it, because there isn't room to have another three undergrounds on the other side, and therefore the output pumps on the other side, we've got this system down here. We've got a pipe pump and an underground, which will, it will fairly quickly and fairly effectively slurp all the mineral water out and push it out into the docking system in Kothar orbit. This then goes straight through another pump into a tank over here and then with another another pump it'll then be brought down to this tank over here where it can be put into the train which isn't very full and taken down to the planet in order to be used as part of the process of making the iridium. So because one of the spaceships wasn't unloading we're not quite sure why it was working um, because we thought we were fairly tight on the amount of mineral water we needed and therefore if there was a shortage of it then we would have a problem. However it seems that having one of the ships working was it meant it was able to bring enough over that each, presumably each time the pair of ships went, the amount of mineral water only went down by a relatively small amount each time. And so it took quite a while for it to fail, and so that's why we didn't notice for quite a long time. However, as you can see, the system has f stopped, 
It seems to be because we've run out of enriched vulcanite, which is an odd thing to run out of given everything else I was saying. Uh, maybe we need to be bringing more of it over? I'm not quite sure. However, I did also notice that if we look up here in Koth orbit, the warehouses are full and therefore it is waiting for a spaceship to come out and take it away and presumably that spaceship that comes out will be bringing an enormous amount of enriched vulcanite with it, which will allow the system to start working again. And if we take a look at the ship over in uh, Norbit, we can see yes, it does have uh, 24,000 enriched vulcanite on it. However, it's not leaving and I wonder why not. It looks like we have a vulcanite problem and that's a strange thing to have a problem with because I thought we had an absolutely enormous amounts of it. And in fact, there is quite a lot of it on this belt here. It's just that for some reason it's not finding its way up through here. That's interesting. So it's not being passed through because we think we've got enough in the warehouses up here. Oh, there we go. Some's being loaded. Oh, no, I take it all back. <laughs> the problem is the exact opposite of everything I've been saying. The spaceship is not departing because it's still got lots of iridium in it. It's been it's been too successful. Well, too successful. No, it's been, it's working really, really well. So we've got this warehouse is full, this warehouse is full, these warehouses are full. Therefore, the spaceship is not able to unload properly. Therefore, it didn't have room to load enough vulcanite in, although now it has. It's now put enough vulcanite in, so it, it could leave if it finished unloading. And so we're just waiting for us to actually use some of the iridium, finish unloading this, and then the ship can depart again. So there's actually no problems here. The, uh, we're just a victim of our own success. The spaceships have stopped flying because we have enough of everything. So it's it's, it, it's working perfectly. Um, yeah, no complaints there at all. <laughs> Apart from to my uh, observational skills. But I'll blame that on the on the couple of beers I had at the theatre. Mike has also added in an additional system to bring uh, sand in from where did this come? Oh, this comes from the uh, from the drop-offs here. So sand is produced as a byproduct of pulverizing the uh, the iridium ore or the iridite ore out in, in out with the mine. So you'll see out here, that's a copper mine, that's a bad example. You'll see out here that we're mi he's mining up the iridite, that's being passed through to here where it's being pulverised, crushed down, and then being passed out over here, uh, where the crushed iridite will be put into a train, the sand goes off to a separate station, and is put into a different train, which brings it over to here, where it's then unloaded, and previously it was being passed up here to be made into the uh, into the hydrogen chloride up here. But that's the old system, so now he's added, presumably added in this splitter, which brings it across here, as I was saying, and now allows it to be used with for the, with the uh, new uh, hydrogen chloride system, where this system allows him to make far, far more hydrogen chloride than he was making before, and also still use up all of the sand that's coming from that processing system. Possibly there should be a, a priority on this splitter over here, but I imagine it probably doesn't really matter. Uh, it's, it's very hard to tell what's going on, given that the system is completely stopped because it's filled everything up and therefore can't run anymore. And so this means the, yes, the Iridium system does seem to be finished and working, so hopefully I won't have another thing to report on it next week. I mean, I don't know if we'll be able to run through all of the Iridium we've made in the in the, in the next stream. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but everything does seem to be working quite nicely over here now. Um, and as Micah said, the Iridium is backing up in the, in the Norvis spaceport. In fact, the Iridium has now completely backed up because it's probably a little bit after uh, when he wrote the notes. Back in Norbit, I've been doing a little bit of tidying up. So last time, I, I switched the system over here from sending holmium plates down this belt here to sending holmium ingots because that seemed like a much denser and uh, more effective way to pass stuff through. Uh, so, however, there was a machine up here that was slicing up those holmium ingots into plates so we'd have uh, have the plates available to send down here. And so I've um, I've removed that, and in order to get rid of the plates that were being stockpiled in here, I dumped them onto this belt because that seemed like a great idea. They could just flow down here and go into the system because I had those sorting systems set up. However, I forgot that I hadn't really left those sorting systems in, so they would have ended up down here trying to go into this machine. Uh, but fortunately, somebody in, on stream pointed it out just in time, and I was able to then chuck them aside and, and pass them over here and get them used up. So I've cleaned those out. That's now work. That's now um, a little bit of tidying up done. That's working nicely. Down on the planet, I upgraded the belts over here that are bringing in the glass and the circuits for the uh, advanced solar panel production. You've seen how many solar panels we're getting through. You can tell why we need quite so many of them. Uh, so there's been a little bit of upgrading going on here. And um, yeah, well, we, we seem to have enough now. But this will last until we need to put out another navigational anchor and need another 6,000 solar panels or whatever it is. We also found that the significant data production was um, insufficient. Well, that's not true. The, in, the, the production rate was okay. However, we weren't getting it passed through quickly enough. The, the belts weren't fast enough. And that's at least partly because over here you can see that for every 10 significant data we produce, we also produce 26 blank data cards, which is frankly ridiculous. So I came along here, I've, I've done some, I did some upgrades. My first idea was to use the uh, top half of the belt for half of the machines and the bottom half of the belt for the other half of the machines. And that was, was okay, but it did mean we created rather a lot that then sort of went into just filling up a lot of these belts. So if we look all the way up at the end, we'll probably see some on both sides of it. Or maybe we won't, maybe we've got through all of those already. Um, but it seemed like a bad idea to just create an enormous number quantity of them. And it still wasn't working quite nicely enough. So instead, 
we've now I've now put in filter inserters and we're putting the significant data onto the upper side of the belt or the right side of the belt and then the uh, the blank data cards onto the left the lower side of the belt now I am still a little bit concerned that we're not going to get the um, the data cards out quickly enough but hopefully it'll be all right it's caught up now because we've stopped making the bio 4 science packs but still it's it's mostly working and um, I think well, I think it should be okay but we'll need to keep a bit of an eye on it. While I'm in the science area Tristan did some tweaks to the trains that are bringing up all the bits and pieces for the intermediates for the astro science up here because we found that we were always always running out of the um, the beryllium scaffolds those are the things that were in the um, that we're running out of first and that's because well we, we take in a lot of those here it's 30 per time it runs over here it's uh, it's uh, 40 admittedly um, but I, I tweaked the trains before to bring up a lot more rods however I hadn't increased the number of uh, scaffolds they're bringing up so Tristan's gone and he's he's tried to do something sensible with the proportions and he's probably got it quite quite right so we'll, we'll see over, over time but as long as the trains keep running we shouldn't run out of and, and the beryllium keeps coming in as well of course uh, we shouldn't have any problems up here we should always have enough of everything we need um, We'll just have to see how that goes. As you can see, we're, the system is still running. Um, and we're just filling up this box up here. Ah, now the train has arrived. So you can see now we have a huge number of the uh, of the scaffolds being brought, an even bigger number of the poles, which is fair because we do need more of those, and then relatively small numbers of the bulkheads and the ingots. Now the ingots uh, stack up really, really highly and then get cut up into 10 each. So you can see we've only unloaded half a stack of those and we've not unloaded any of the uh, the bulkheads here. So that gives you an impression of how of the sort of proportions we're getting through. And virtually all, in fact, all of the scaffolds have gone, all of the poles have gone, so that's why we need to bring up quite so many of those. Tristan has also put in some additional signals down along the top of the spaceport, so that's just over here, because you, we saw in the videos last week that somehow a train managed, we managed to get a train jam going along here. Um, he thinks it was probably just very, very unlucky timing, where a train happened to be coming along here, just as another train tried to come out of here. Now, I'm not quite sure that's right. I think the uh, train coming along this way was trying to come into the same station, so it looked like one of these had called for more than one train. I'm not certain of that, though. However, he's now put in a load of signals across the top of here, like these these ones in the middle of the triangles and that means that we can be sure that even if that does happen the train coming along here will pull in and stop here and then this train will still be able to pull out and go out this way and we won't get any any sort of train jams in here so that's been made completely safe i hope it shouldn't happen again we shouldn't see any problems fingers crossed but we'll see how that goes and down on the planet, Mark has been doing some tidying up. He's been dealing with some of the things that have been building up in the boxes of shame down here. And he's also been filling up the boxes of shame because he started to remove the air filter belt that was running all the way around the outside of the factory. In fact, I say started to remove. I think he has removed it all. Um, I don't see any of it left running down the middles of these uh, re these railway lines or going anywhere around the edge of it. So because we do have full robo coverage, he's been able to just go around and, and pull up the whole thing. And that is why the uh, chests of shame over here are just so full of clean and dirty filters. I imagine those will probably get fed over into the crusher matrons up here, but yes they are. You can see these, these crushers up here are in fact pulling in various types of filters, uh, delivery canning capsules, the, the actual air purifiers themselves, gas power stations and so on. All these things that we don't need anymore, those are being pulled in. And then we're trying to pulverize them down into nothingness just to destroy them, take, to get rid of them, so that they're not taking up space in all of our storage systems. Because at this point we don't need any of this stuff anymore and there aren't any other recipes that use it. And unfortunately we don't have the factory Oreo 2 recycling mechanic yet so we can't take them in and then turn them back into useful products that we can then go off and reuse somewhere else so sadly we are actually just destroying them and the system over here I think I've talked about this before but because the uh, the destruction only has a 25% chance of actually succeeding we have the uh, outserters unloading these machines as well that will drop anything that's, um, that doesn't get destroyed back out here it'll get put back into the wet into the chest like that as you see there and then it can be passed back into the machines again to be crushed once again and so it's out on average it'll take four attempts to destroy each item but this means they'll get passed around and round and round until that actually happens it is going to take us a very very long time to get through all of these filters but oh well i guess we have the time there's also quite a lot of stuff down here that shouldn't really be here like there's some beryllium poles in there there's 118 of those those would be, could be potentially be quite useful what we should probably do is have requesters on all of the chests or all of the warehouses down here pulling in whatever thing it is that they um they, they they offer and dumping it back into them. Uh, we'd have to be careful with some of those. Actually, these are red ones. We couldn't do it with them because if we did, it would get put into it would get taken from here, put into the blue requester chest, then passed back through by an inserter, and then taken out again, put back in there, and just go round and round forever. But over here, all of these ones that are with grey chests, we, we could do that when it, and it would be absolutely fine. So we could pull those beryllium sticks back out of the logistics system, put them back into this warehouse. We should probably do that at some point. 
Mark has also sorted out an issue with the uh, the iron and steel system. We we, we realised when I say we, it was he noticed it, and um, I actually <laughs> rather embarrassingly I sort of noticed it on the graph, but then didn't re it didn't really register with me until later on when uh, Mark said there'd been a problem with it, and I went oh. I sort of noticed that the um, that the iron and steel ingots were looked a bit low, but then somehow I got distracted by something else and I never said anything about it. So that was a, uh, a little bit bad. But this this meant that for rather a long time, um, for about two hours across here, we weren't making any iron or steel. And you can see that we normally need quite a lot of it. And now that the system is up and running again, we're making it quite solidly while we try and fill the buffers up and catch up again. And this was all caused by these this, this inserter and chest being one square over to the right. And that meant that the um, this machine here had taken in quite a lot of sand. It hadn't been a problem for quite a long time. But then eventually the output buffer had filled up with landfill because it wasn't being unloaded into the chest and the system stalled. And then Mark came over and went, what? And moved it back over so it actually started working again. Uh, so yeah, this system over here, it, it's still running quite happily, um, but in it's making, oh, okay, we've caught up on the iron, we're still making a bit of steel, but down here at the bottom, you can see that this, this uh, warehouse is nearly full, so we've very nearly caught up. I think Mark said that uh, the reason he noticed that it had failed was because the wood wasn't getting taken away and wasn't getting used up at the rate he was expecting it to, because wood is supposed to come over here and be turned into charcoal in order to then be turned into steel. I also just noticed that somebody has relabeled the uh, the wood drop-off station as woo, so um, that's fun. Finally, Mark has been keeping a general eye on all the systems down here on Big Ridge just to make sure that they're, you know, working properly. It looks at the moment like we have about half of the Vitamolange extract going off this way and half it going up this way, so half it's going around here to be made into Vitalic Acid and then presumably scrubbers as well as we need them. And then the other half is going up here to be made into the Vitalic Reagent, that thing that we are always short of. Um, and yeah, that is, is flowing, so we are presumably this means we are using it up about as fast as we're making it at the moment. So of all the Vitamolange things, this seems to be currently, seems to be the concern. And looking at the graphs, yeah, we can see that the consumption rate is much higher than the production rate. So we do have a problem here. Uh, this is going to need to be expanded even further, I'm afraid, Mark. There's a lot of it already, I know, but <laughs> apparently we're using it up a lot faster than we're producing it. I get a lot of that is going to be for making uh, modules for all, all of our tier 6 productivity and everything's out there. But then a lot of it is also going into science and other things too, so it's, it's just a little bit of a problem at the moment. We need, we need more of it than we can get. Speaking of science and researchers, we've done long range star mapping 18 and 19. That's brought, that's given us those two on the um, on the list up here that I was pointing out in the first video. Uh, a couple of interesting things down at the bottom here, man with sword and pie. So those those were relevant. I won't talk any more about that because of risk of spoilers, but I did talk about them quite a bit in the uh, in the first video of this week's uh, set. We've researched the portable singularity reactor. So this is a presumably the portable version of the singularity reactor, funny that. Uh, and this will be something you can stick in your armor and it will generate a certain amount of power for you. As you can see here, it will produce a maximum of 4 megawatts. How does that compare to other ones? So 4 megawatts from the portable singularity reactor, 3.2 megawatts from the portable fusion reactor, and 2.4 megawatts from the portable nuclear reactor. So that's not really that big of a much of a difference in each, each one. I mean, I would expect it to at least double for each each, uh, each step you go up through there, but no, apparently not. Uh, still going to be better than the um, than the pathetic 1.2 megawatts you get out of the uh, RTG Mark II, and the 800 kilowatts you get out of the RTG Mark I, and then we can carry on down to 540 kilowatts, 200 kilowatts, and then 12. Oh, there's 12 megawatts from the energy absorber. Can you put that in a personal grid? I think you can. Yes, you can. All right, that's probably the best one to use then, generally. Just charge your armor up off the uh, off the normal power grid. That'd be much, much better. Um, but yeah, you can see that a lot of these, they're sort of almost double. So that goes from 200 to 540. That's almost tripling. Then 540 to 800. Well, if that one went 2, 4, then that'd be 800. So that'd be a double. 1.2, that's only an extra 50%. So it's getting a little bit stingy at that point. Then you get a double out of it. But then, the, uh, then it's only another 50%. And then it's only another 25%. So it's getting a little bit, yeah, the top upper upper range is getting a little bit stingy over here, but it doesn't really matter because we don't need that much power in our suits anyway. Because most of the time we're not going out and using them very much. We're just doing everything with the uh, with the um, navigation satellite. And finally, we are still working on mining productivity to twelve. This has been an on and off one for quite a long time, where we've been going, oh, we've run out of energy science, or oh, we've run out of astro science. Let's do a bit more of the mining productivity twelve. Because as you can see, it takes thirty one thousand science packs, and it does take the bio fours, which are you know fairly expensive. So we're taking, yeah, it's a lot of science packs required. It's a big research. But you do get mining productivity out of it, which is very, very valuable, very, very worth having. Although, you know, thinking about it, how long do you have to have mining productivity 12 for before it before the extra ore you get from that makes up for the amount of ore and everything else that was required 
to make all of those science packs? And I'm not sure what the answer is, and I'm not going to do the maths, because it might be depressing if we work out we'll never actually make a, make a net profit on it. <laughs> And also it requires a bit too much thinking and nobody wants to watch me do that. And so that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you very much for watching as ever. We'll be back on Monday, also known as tomorrow, for the next stream in the series where I shall be uh, poking some more at the uh, beryllium. And then if I'm lucky, I'll go off and have a look at the Naquium. Uh, we'll see how that goes. That'll be at 7.30pm UK time as normal. Then on Wednesday I'll be back for some more Satisfactory where I'm going to be... Well, I've got the nuclear power up and running, so now it's a bit more of the, uh, the things that aren't actually science packs but might as well be. And then next weekend, we'll have some more of these update videos as usual. So, thank you very much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.